Good morning, everybody. It is phenomenal seeing all of y'all. You having a good week so far? Are you ready for spring break coming up? All righty. Well, I want to welcome those who are joining online. And then once again, it's always a privilege seeing y'all. It is a privilege to introduce the next guest speaker. And it's our last guest speaker uh, before spring break. So he is the founder of In Christ International Bible College. For those of you online, I encourage you to check that out. They're doing wonderful things. He is a premier uh, teacher on the topic of faith. And I just listened to a teaching that he did the other day on um, in Christ, what it means to be in Christ. And man, that, that absolute blessed me. And I just think that he has a very timely message and it's gonna be an answer to prayer for many of y'all. And I, and I believe that this morning is going to be life-changing and what you're believing for and hoping for and asking the Holy Spirit to give you answers on, I just believe today is going to be that day that, that is a mile marker in your life. So please give a warm, caress welcome to Brother Mark Hankins. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Wow, we are glad to be back here. It's been about a year. Yeah, do I look a year older? Nah, you, you do. So, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I'm super blessed to be back here. We'd like to thank uh, Andrew Womack, one of the, our favorite people in the world. Amen. And uh, Karis Bible School, all the staff and everybody for all the work that they do. Amen. And I'm blessed, you know, I'm from Louisiana which is at, uh, anybody from Louisiana, uh, which is kind of at sea level, you know? And then you come up here and you're like, whoa, wow, what happened to the oxygen? And uh, I have my wonderful wife here, Trina. Stand up, Trina, maybe. And hello, everybody. Actually, we met at Bible College, 1975 at Bible College, and we've been married 45 years, 45 years, and um, two kids, both are in the ministry, and eight grandkids, so uh, uh, the Lord has blessed me with a wonderful wife, and we met at Bible College. She's from Colorado, I'm from Texas, and uh, you know, you wonder why there's so many mountains, you know, in Colorado is because Texans have so much authority as believers, they moved it all to Colorado. <laughs> they moved all the mountains. That's why they're here. Anyway, she's real proud to be a Coloradan and, and I'm blessed to be a Texan. There's only two, two kinds of people in the world. There's Texans and those who wish they were Texans. It's two kinds of people. So sorry about that, but... Um, so we met at Bible college and here, here's how we met. I was a senior, so I went four years to Bible school and uh, she, I was a senior, she's a freshman. So I saw her come into the cafeteria and I was a senior, she's a freshman. And I thought, well, that's a new, new girl. So I told my friends, I said, I'm gonna ask her out on a date. And my friend said, well, I bet you won't. I said, I bet you I will. I bet you I will right now. So I walked across the cafeteria, and so I introduced myself, and I said, I want to ask you out on a date. And she said, well, I need to pray about it. I said, God's not that far away. Let's just pray right now. That's what I said. And I said, matter of fact, let's just join hands. Can we join hands? And I said, Lord, if you want Trina to go out on a date with me, just, uh, just let both of us know. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So I said, what did the Lord tell you? She said, well, I'm not sure. I said, well, he told me yes. I'll pick you up at seven. Anyway, so kids and grandkids later, you know, nothing like boldness, right? Uh, look, I... Um, I, bu I brought a few books and they're out on the table and they're all free. Uh, the only problem is I, I didn't, I don't think I brought enough. Uh, so I brought a hundred of each and I don't know how many is going to be here this session or the next session. 
So, you know, maybe get like one book and then hang around and see if you can get the other book. But these are brand new books we just did. One is called The Great Confession. The Great Confession. And The Great Confession is that Jesus is Lord. It is the one confession that stands between you and hell. <laughs> it's Jesus is Lord. I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So the great confession, how to hold fast to your confession. And Dad Hagen uh, said the confession of our faith is one of the most important, significant, and valuable teachings in all the Word of God. How to hold fast to your confession, say the same thing, and agree with God. The other book is called The God Kind of Life. The God kind of life, which is a study on eternal life. And uh, all religions give lessons. Only Jesus Christ gives life. All right. I said all religions give lessons. Only Jesus Christ gives life. And that is eternal life. So it's a study on the life of God, God kind of life. And then um, uh, uh, we don't bring any, any CDs or anything like that. But all the messages uh, on the um, Mark Hankins Ministries app, you can download the app and the app is free. All the messages on there, you can listen to them anytime, day or night. Uh, thousands of messages on there. So just down, download Mark Hankins Ministries app and then you can listen to all of them or you can order uh, Mark Hankins on the website. All right, is that good? All right, now today uh, we're gonna have a little bit of fun and um, I have to be finished at 8.50, is that right? Is there somebody gonna wave a flag or something? Or? Oh, whoa. <laughs> Don't jump, guys. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we're going to study on who you are in Christ. Uh, if you are in Christ, you are never in crisis. Amen. Amen. And so look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. So we're going to do a little bit of a study on who you are in Christ or, you know, some on your identification with Christ. And we'll cover the subject to the best of our ability in this amount of time. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Can you find that? And the Apostle Paul here teaching on this revelation called in Christ, in him or in whom. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore... If any, any man or any person, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, yes. Amen. they are a new creature. Amen. Old things are passed away. Behold, everything has become new. Amen. Or you could say it this way. Jesus Christ changes everything. Yes. Or you could say Jesus did not go to the cross, die and be raised from the dead. And say, I sure hope that helped you a little bit. <laughs> if you're having a blue Monday. No, when Jesus was raised from the dead, he said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. And this changes everything. What happened from the cross, the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ are what happened in Christ. In Christ. So the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, show you what happened to Christ in death and resurrection. In Paul's letters, he tells you what happened in Christ. Yep. Are the four gospels tell you what man saw and Paul's revelation or Paul's letters tell you what God saw. Yep. Are the four gospels, we're talking about in the death, crucifixion, death and resurrection of Christ, four gospels um, tell you what man saw or what happened in the scene. And Paul's letters or Paul's revelation tells you what happened in the unseen, in the unseen. So Paul's revelation tells you what God saw, what angels saw, and even what the devil saw in the death and resurrection of Christ. So when you talk about who you are in Christ and uh, what happened in the death and resurrection of Christ, I like to say it this way, the four gospels are a photograph of your redemption and Paul's letters are an x-ray. Same picture, just a different kind of picture. In other words, you look different in an x-ray than you do in a photograph. 
like very few people send out an x-ray of themselves for Christmas. So, um, because it's so hard to recognize you in an x-ray. You're like, I think that looks kind of like him. But um, the x-ray shows you what's happening on the inside and the photo just shows you what's happening on the outside, what you look like on the outside. So to study Paul's letters or Paul's revelation, he uses that phrase in Christ, in him, in whom 130 times. 130 sounds like it's really, really a lot, but really a lot of those are greetings. So really there's only about 35 significant in Christ, in him, in whom scriptures that you should have written down. I usually put it down the King James and then I put it in some other translations, Amplified Bible and some other translations. So we're going to look at some of those uh, this morning on who you are and what you have in Christ. So right there while you're at 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I didn't know my Bible. We can quote some of these things. Uh, but he says it, that you're a new creature in Christ. And the word new means new in kind or new in quality. And it literally means unheard of before. So it means uh, God did something in Christ that had never been done before to produce something that had never happened before. And actually the two words in Christ, a writer by the name of A.J. Gordon has a book called In Christ. And there's parts of it I like. The part, one of the parts I like is he says the two words in Christ are really the most powerful revelation in the New Testament, except for the words God manifest in the flesh. In other words, the most powerful revelation in the New Testament is the incarnation, God manifest in the flesh, in the person of Christ. So he says now in Christ is really the second most significant revelation in the New Testament. Now, when Kenneth E. Hagan or Dad Hagan came to my dad's church, um, he would stay for two or three weeks and he was sent to teach on the subject of faith. And um, so I listened to him many, many times teaching on faith. Well, when he came, he said, um, um, seven steps to the highest kind of faith. Well, I don't know about you, but when he's teaching, I thought, well, I'd sure like to have the highest kind. <laughs> Whatever the highest kind is, that's what I want. So he said, number one, I'm going to give you all seven. I'm just going to tell you what he said. Number one, he said, the, the, the number one step to the highest kind of faith is to know who you are in Christ, your identification with Christ. And he said, that's a step to the highest kind of faith. In other words, in Christ, you're never fighting for victory. You're always fighting from victory. Amen. So. First thing you do as, as a position of faith is you take your place in Christ. So dad Hagen said, you just look a lot better in Christ than you do outside of him. Yeah. Amen. How many of you have seen yourself in him and you look a lot better in him than you do outside of him. <laughs> then I came up with a couple other quotes real quickly. This is, um, um, that God did in Christ what he wanted to do in every person. In other words, everything God did in Christ, or you can say it this way, uh, everything God did in Christ, he did it for us, set to the credit of our account, just like we did it. And there's really in the church, what we call two ordinances in the church. One is water baptism. As soon as you make Jesus your Lord, baptized in water. Water baptism shows your identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. The other uh, ordinance in the church that you and I, we practice is called uh, Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. And you take the bread, which is his body. You take the cup, which is his blood. And really, you're now in union with Christ. His life, his blood, his body. He's in you and you're in him. So when he talks about who you are in Christ, um, 1 Corinthians six seventeen says, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. He's joined to the Lord. In other words, he's, tr he's trying to describe what happened when you got born again. And he said, when you made Jesus your Lord, you could say, I got saved. You could say, I got born again. You could say, I've received eternal life. Or you could say, I'm now in Christ. All of those terms are synonymous. And so Paul's number one, number one, 
uh, terminology, which the terminology itself, he said, he got it from the Lord Jesus. The terminology, terminology itself is supernatural. Someone said, when you got born again, you got in Christed. Or most translators will, will kind of leave the two words alone, except other translations may say something like, you are now in union with Christ. Well, at what point are you in union with Christ? He said, he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit, which simply means when you make Jesus your Lord, your spirit is the part of you that is now joined to Christ. Amen. Like a vine and a branch, a head and a body, the same life that's in the vine flows in the branch. So when you talk about identification with Christ, it means to make identical or it means sameness. So that means when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, in your inner man, your spirit is the same life, which would be the God kind of life, the same love, the God kind of love, same blessing that's in Christ is now in you, and the same authority that's in Christ is now in you. All right? So now we're going to look at a couple more scriptures on, on your, who you are in Christ and your identification with Christ. Praise the Lord. Excuse me, but I'm thinking about hundreds of them now. And so I'm just trying to slow down to get through the right ones. So jump over to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. And while you're over there, you know, you can write down Philemon, verse 6. Because he says that the communication of your faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that's in you in Christ. Our other translation says that your faith may become effectual, effectual by the acknowledging of everything that is yours in your identification with Christ. Amen. In other words, the moment you make Jesus the Lord of your life, really, you have a new identity. You're not what your mama made you. You're not what the past made you. You're not what your mistakes made you. Come on, you are the workmanship of God created in Christ. So you have to see yourself in him. So how was that produced? Whoa, man, Galatians 2.20, can you find that? Here the apostle Paul says, I am, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. All right, other translations are great with this, but actually the King James is not too bad. Amen. Because the King James starts off with I am. In other words, what happened on the cross has influenced who I am. So you have to be careful when you say I am outside of your identification with Christ. In other words, this identity trumps every other identity that you carry. I am, Paul says, crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All right, there's some other translations that, that are real good. One translation says, I consider myself as having died and now I'm enjoying a second existence, which is simply Jesus using my body. All right, another good translation says, the Message Bible says, Paul says, I identified myself completely with Christ. In other words, my identity now comes totally from Jesus Christ and what happened on the cross, I was identified there with him. All right, now here's a, there's another good one here and I'm trying to find it for you real quickly here. Uh, and this is, uh, I think the uh, TPT, what do you call that? There you go, passion. Here, this says it pretty good. My old identity has been co-crucified with Christ. All right, praise the Lord. Y'all still with me here? My old identity has been co-crucified with Christ and no longer lives. And now the essence of this new life is no longer mine. For the anointed one lives his life through me. We live in union as one. My new life is empowered by the faith of the Son of God who loves me so much that he gave himself for me and dispenses his life into mine. All right, let's try y'all. Can y'all hear that? In other words, what we call Paul's revelation 
and you pray the Ephesians one prayer, which is what dad Hagen told us to pray. Paul's revelation, father God, I'm asking you to give unto me the spirit of wisdom, revelation, the knowledge of God, the eyes of my understanding, being light that I may know the hopes of God and riches of inheritance and then the exceeding greatness of power towards us who believe according to the work of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So Paul is simply praying there that you and I would see the same thing that he saw. In other words, Paul's revelation was not just for Paul. It was for every believer. Are y'all still here? So dad Hagen, he told us, pray the Ephesians one prayer and pray it every day, at least once a day for at least six months. First thing that'll happen is the Bible will become a different book to you. So I was 17 years old and I determined I was going to pray that prayer every day, at least once a day. Actually, I did it twice a day, every morning, every evening, had it on a little card, pulled it out every day, twice a day. Father God, this is what I'm asking you for. Not a new Corvette. Come on. I'm asking you that you'd give unto me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, the eyes of my heart. In other words, it's going to change the way you see your eyes, where you see yourself. And so dad Hagen said, the Bible become a different book to you. And then he said this and go through Paul's letters. Every time you see the two words in Christ, in him, in whom circle or underline those two words. And then every day make a bold confession that this is who I am. And this is what I have because I'm a new creature in Christ. Are y'all still with me? So in, in, in praying that prayer, you're saying, father God, I want to see, I want to know. By revelation, not just a bunch of uh, head knowledge. I want to know by revelation. That's why the Holy Spirit is involved in this whole process. The Holy Spirit's job, Jesus said in John 14, 15, 16, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he says this, he's going to move in you, be in you forever. And then he said that in that day, you will know that I'm in the father and you're in me and I'm in you. All right, let's try that one more time. He said, when the Holy Spirit moves on the inside of you, he says, you're going to know that I'm one with the Father and you're one with me and I'm in you. That's why when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's job is he takes everything Christ has done for us and translates it into personal experience. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, you can have a lot of theology and no personal victory. But the Holy Spirit, he's the head of the revelation department. And he'll say, let me show you something that happened on the cross. And you were there in the death. You were there in the burial. You were there in the resurrection of Christ. You are now in Christ. All right, go to Ephesians 2, 4 through 6 real quickly. Uh, Well, we could go through 10. Praise the Lord. All right, y'all found Ephesians 2, 4. I'm quoting some of this. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he quickened, and the word quickened there, Amplified Bible, women's Bible, because it has more words. The Amplified Bible says, he made us alive together with Christ, and he gave us the very same life that is in him. So he made us alive, quickened us together with Christ, and raised us up together with Christ, and made us sit down together with him in heavenly places with him and now in him. And he gave us the same life that he gave to Christ. The same means the same identical life that God gave to Christ in the resurrection. He gave that to every one of us and raised us up together with him and made us sit down together with him, which is a place of reality. And it's a place of authority and it's a place of blessing. You've been made alive, raised up and seated together with Christ or he gave you the same life that he gave to Christ. So your confession would be is I have the life of God on the inside of me, the God kind of life. I have the very same life that raised Christ from the dead and same, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells on the inside of me. So now I have the same identical life, same identical spirit that raised Christ from the dead. That's my identification with Christ. So the Holy Spirit's job is to take everything Christ has done for us and everything... (laughs) And everything is different. I like to say it this way. The Holy Spirit has a reputation for working with some real losers and making them champions. So don't look around right now, but there could be a few 
people that were losers, but the Holy Spirit, even if you're a slow learner, he'll work with you until you get it. And one day you'll get up and you'll say, wow, I got the same life that's in Christ. Amen. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And my identity now is found in him. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. So the Holy Spirit takes everything Christ has done for us and translates that into personal victory. <laughs> Without the Holy Spirit, something is actually lost in translation. Uh, I preach a lot in other countries, so I have a translator and they're a pretty important person. So I say one thing, they need to say the same thing I'm saying to translator <laughs> and do it well. And so you hear about the monk that was living in a monastery and he was trying so hard to be holy, living there alone, trying to be holy, you know, for years. And one day he went down in the basement and read the original manuscripts of the scriptures and uh, they heard him holler from the basement and he screamed, oh, it's celebrate. All those years he'd been living alone there in the monastery, and really the original translation was celebrate. He had been living celibate, <laughs> and the original translation was celebrate. So I see a lot of Christians at church that something's been lost in translation. Come on there, <laughs> when really the original word is celebrate. In other words, when you see what God has done for you in Christ, and you can tell when you're getting it, you just get a big smile on your face. You go, oh. God did that for me in Christ. And that's my new identity. Amen. Praise the Lord. So the apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, he says this, which is a great title for a book. And there actually is a book already uh, that has this title. Paul calls himself, I knew a man in Christ. Whether in the body or outside the body, he said, such a one ascended to the third heaven. So when Paul calls himself something, he calls himself a man in Christ. In other words, this person in Christ is a different kind of a human. You look like a human on the outside, but on the inside, you've got the spirit of God living on the inside and you got the life of God on the inside. So you are a new kind of creature that never existed before. You're a new creature in Christ. You should celebrate. Now, amen. So as we study who you are and what you have in Christ, let's look at a few in Christ scriptures. One is Colossians chapter two, verse nine and 10. So turn to Colossians two, verse nine and 10. And uh, these are just some of the, the outstanding in Christ scriptures. Colossians 2, 9 says, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Let's try that one more time. In Christ, in him is what? All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who's the head of all principality and power. Amen. Huh. TPT translation. For our spiritual wealth is in him, in Christ. Uh, this is Colossians 2, 3. Our spiritual wealth is in him like a hidden treasure waiting to be discovered. Heaven's wisdom and endless riches of revelation knowledge are hidden in Christ. Verse 10. Our own completeness is now found in him. We are completely filled with God as Christ's fullness overflows within us. And he's the head of every kingdom and authority in the universe. All right. So God put into Christ, or one writer said this way, God made Christ the treasury of all that he is. And then he put you in the treasury. All right. Let's try that one more time. I like to tell people, if you're not impressed with who you are in Christ, you just don't know who he is. Let's say it one more time. If you're not impressed with who you are in Christ, you just haven't seen him lately. 
All right. So because God did in Christ, put into Christ everything he wanted you to have as a new creature. And Jesus as the last Adam is actually the archetype of a new humanity. So you're not just a forgiven sinner. Come on. You're not just kind of struggling to try to make it somewhere. God actually has put everything he has in Christ and he made you complete in him. We have to read this in the Amplified Bible. Oh, my goodness. The Amplified Bible says it this way. Uh, Here it is. For you are in him made full, having come to fullness of life in Christ, and you too are filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you reach full spiritual stature, and he's the head of all rule and authority of every angelic principality and power. Huh. Are y'all still with me? All right, let's see. Praise the Lord. I just, I just throw these here on my phone so I don't have to write them all down my hand. In him, the Amplified Bible. The Amplified Bible, my wife probably has it. The Amplified Bible. You are in Christ. You're in him, full and having come to the fullness of life. Everybody say life. Life. Same life that's in Christ. And you're filled with the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You reach full spiritual maturity. And Christ is the head of all spiritual authority. Hmm. So when I was about 17, I kind of started writing these scriptures down. And I started going... Well, this is pretty impressive that I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. How am I going to get this to work for me? Right? Two major ways. Number one, the Holy Spirit is going to give you a fresh revelation, open the eyes of your heart. And number two is your confession of faith, confessing who you are and what you have in Christ. That's the way faith works. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, Let's look at Romans chapter eight and verse two, Romans chapter eight, verse two. And here's what it says. You ready for this one? Let me see this because I wrote this down. Romans eight, two. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ, Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Y'all know that verse? Romans eight, one, no condemnation. Those are in Christ. Romans eight, two is what? For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So other translations say the law of the spirit of life in Christ lifts me out of the law of sin and death. Uh, This is the Amplified Bible. It says the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being. That's pretty interesting. Amplified through uh, through that in there. No. The law of the spirit of life. He said it's the law of our new being. Or let's say it this way. It is there, this spiritual law of life that comes from Christ. Or this spiritual life that you receive from Christ. In other words, when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, life, eternal life, the God kind of life comes on the inside of your spirit. Listen, and it is that life that makes you a new creature. The devil cannot dominate any person that has this life. This life is the crowning achievement of the plan of redemption. All right, let's try that one more time. In other words, in the mind of God, come on, we were dead spiritually. And the mind of God, crowning achievement of the plan of redemption, what happened on the cross, resurrection of Christ, is God's plan is to put life, spiritual life, the God kind of life, the same life that's in God, and put that back in the spirit of a believer or of a human being. Once that life comes into the spirit of a believer, immediately the Bible says you have passed from death unto life and the devil cannot dominate any person that has this life. What is this life? Because you don't get it when you die. Come on, you don't get eternal life when you die. It's best to get it before. Actually, you receive it when you make Jesus the Lord of your life. 
And it's the number one purpose that Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it overflowing in you. In other words, abundantly. Yes. Amen. Yes, so when God made Jesus alive, he saw us there and he made us alive together with him. And he gave us the same life that he gave to Christ. What is that? Resurrection life, overcoming life, the God kind of life. In other words, you, got, you have entered into the God kind of everything. The God kind of faith, God kind of life, God kind of authority. Man, you are something. Amen. I was, you ought to look in the mirror sometimes and say, say, you are something. You ought to look in the mirror and say, Holy Spirit, I know you're in there. Don't act like you're not in there because I know you're in there. Now, Holy Spirit, I yield to you. And here's what Smith Wigglesworth said. The Holy Spirit will think through your mind. Come on, you get filled. He will speak through your lips and he will magnify Jesus in a way that you never could without his help. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. So now, this life is what makes you a new creature. Is you have the life of God in you. You can actually have it in overflowing measure. Amen. Some people that's in there, they're like, <laughs> this life, or I said it earlier, every religion offers lessons, but man's number one need was not a lesson. Yes, sir. Come, on. Come on, I've studied religions all over the world and they all have some pretty good little lessons here and there. But what makes Jesus different than other religions is he didn't come to say, all right, I'm going to give you all a few points here, a few lessons, try to help you out. No, Jesus says, you are dead and you need life. And I came to give you the God kind of life. And he says, he that hath the son hath this life. Amen. And so first John, he says, he says, we know that we have eternal life. In other words, as a present possession, when you know you have this life on the inside of you, it's the very life of Christ, the God kind of life, resurrection life, overcoming life. It is a spiritual substance that actually flows out of God himself. Matter of fact, God has so much of it, he can't contain himself. That out of the throne of God, there's river of life that flows out of the throne of God. What is this life? You know, so, some people act like it's something they got, you know, for Christmas. And they don't know what to do with it. In other words, do you know what it is, what it does, what it will do in you, what it will do through you? Because this life on the inside of you, the very life of Christ, the very life of God on the inside of you, what will it do? Number one, it makes you more than a conqueror over the devil. What else will it do? That life, that life on the inside of you will actually... Quicken your mind, produce light, and actually make you smarter than regular folks. It will actually increase your intellect. Don't look at anybody right now. I said, this life will increase your intellect. It will enhance your personality. It will give you a confidence and a boldness when you know this life is on the inside of you. So now I got a couple of quotes on what this life is, puts you in union with Christ, or now your identification with Christ, who you are in him. Are you ready for this? All right. This comes from a writer named James Stewart. He says this, this life which flows from Christ into man is something totally different from anything experienced on the merely natural plane. It is different not only in degree, it is also a different kind of life. It is supernatural. It is a new quality of life. As the Apostle Paul puts it elsewhere, you are a new creation. It is not just the intensification of powers already possessed. It is the sudden emergence of an entirely new and original element. Whenever a man comes to be in Christ, he begins to live in the sphere of the post-resurrection life of Jesus. The life which he now lives bears the quality of eternity. McLeod Campbell says in his great work on the atonement, he says, ordinary religion is so much a struggle to secure an unknown future happiness instead of being the meditation 
invitation on and the welcoming of the present gift of eternal life. In other words, this is not something you're going to get later on. This is something we know we have eternal life. We know what it is. We know where we got it from. It is a controlled substance. You can't just get it anywhere. You're going to have to get it from Jesus. Come on. So John chapter five, Jesus said, the father has life in himself and he's given to the son to have life in himself. In other words, if you were to interview Jesus and say, what is it that makes you so different than everybody else? He'd say, I got this life in me. What will it do? It'll drive out sickness and disease. It's the life of God. Come on, it's eternal life. It's the life of Christ. So that when you lay hands on people, the life of Christ will flow into them. It is a spiritual substance. Y'all still here? He said, it is not the intensification of powers already possessed. It is a sudden emergence of entirely new and original element. So let's just say it this way. Praise the Lord. God made Christ the treasury of all that he is. And then when you made Jesus your Lord, he put you in him. So that now everything that's in God now belongs to the believer as an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ that you're a new creature in Christ. Now, Romans chapter five. Y'all ready to jump over Romans five? Because we just Romans eight. Romans five, Paul in Romans five is comparing two men, Adam who disobeyed and the effect of his disobedience and Christ who he calls the last Adam. So really the whole Bible is about two Adams. I got you. All right. Praise the Lord. How much time? Got? So, so he says this one, one man, Adam got us in this mess and one man, Jesus Christ got us out of this mess. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then he measures the effect of one man, Adam and one man, Christ. In other words, he says, all of us were affected by these two men. Amen. First birth puts you in Adam. Your second birth puts you in Christ, the last Adam, right? So he says, you receive the abundance of grace. Romans 5, 7, in the gift of righteousness, you reign in life by one man, Jesus Christ, right? Then go down to Romans 5, 20, what's it say? For where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That was a scripture on the wall of my grandpa's church. Uh, Romans 5, 20, sin abounded, grace did much more abound. But one translation, which is Lawbox translation says, it says, God's work in Christ far exceeds any damage done to us by Adam's fall. All right, let's try that one more time. In other words, sin about grace did much more, man. Our, our God's work in Christ far exceeds any damage done to us by Adam's fall. In other words, God measured the damage done to you and the human race. And he says, I'm going to do something in Christ that will far exceed any damage. In other words, uh, God's work in Christ is greater than anything that's ever happened to you. What happened to Jesus far exceeds anything that has ever happened to you. So you can't say, well, if you knew what happened to me, you'd know the reason that I'm the way I am. No, you can say, if you saw what happened in Christ, you'd know why I'm the way I am because my identification now comes from Christ. Now, our grandson Dylan, our grandson Dylan just I had this, uh, uh, stem cell, bone marrow, transplant. is actually a, a year or two ago, <laughs> He's now, what, eight, seven? Anyway, he just played on his first basketball team. When we took him in, he had tumor on the inside of my daughter's uh, little boy, and he's a twin, has a twin sister. So when he went in, uh, they said there's tumor in there, man, they got tubes on him. They put him in a coma for two months. They said he'll never come out of the, toma, of the coma. They said he'll never talk again. And they said, he, you know, we had a crisis every day. His, you know, his, his heart, his lungs, his liver. I mean, you got a crisis every day. So they went into some treatments and put treatments on him. And after two years of treatments, you know, we were fixing to ring the bell, which means that, that uh, leukemia cancer is in total remission. But before we rang the bell, they did another test on him. They said, we found a bad cell. They said, the only way to fix this is he's going to have to have a bone marrow transplant, which would be a stem cell. So to get a stem cell transplant, had to go to New Orleans. So this is a three-year process. Not three months. We thought we had it, you know, and then now they say it. So, uh, well, okay. So we visited with the doctor and uh, had some discussions, you know, and so said, okay. So they said, well, if we're going to do a stem cell transplant in Dillon, 
Number one, we have to find a donor, which is a match. Well, Dylan has three brothers and all three of them matched, but one of them actually was a better match. And that was his brother, Gavin. Well, Gavin wasn't that happy about being a match <laughs> because they have to take it in and they actually took his blood and then they put it like in this thing and spin it out and take the stem cells and they got enough stem cells to last all of Dylan's life. So the day that they're going to put this in, I'm trying to make the short as possible. The day that they're going to put uh, Gavin, his brother's stem cells in to Dylan, very critical. They said, because if he rejects uh, the stem cells, then they're, they're, he cannot live. So we're praying that when these stem cells go in to Dylan, he'll say, welcome, y'all come in, glad to see you. <laughs> we're standing outside the room looking in the window and he's got uh, Gavin's blood on a pole and it starts to go in for six hours. Man, everything went perfect. I mean, he got uh, Gavin's stem cells and then before they put Gavin's stem cells in him, they said, the doctor actually said, Mr. Dylan, we're getting ready to say goodbye to you because you will no longer be the same person after you get Gavin's stem cells. You will actually have a different identity and different DNA because you're getting the stem cells of Gavin. He said, and matter of fact, this is so significant that if Gavin commits a crime, you could be convicted for it because you have the same DNA. Then the doctor said, Matter of fact, from this day forward, you will have two birthdays. When you were originally born and then when Gavin's stem cells came on the inside of you and that, well, actually that you're a different person from this day forward. So then that is a processing time, took a couple of weeks. Then we took him back in and the doctor tested him and said, because some people only receive a, um, they, they may get up to 40% of actually the stem cells some 50, some 60%, but we were praying for 100%. So what happened is after two weeks, we take uh, Dylan back in and the doctor says, we tested him and he is now 100% Gavin. <laughs> which means he has gone into the highest kind of remission, which they call molecular remission, which means there's no evidence he ever had leukemia in any cell in his body. If medical science can do something like this, imagine what God did in Christ and imagine who your donor is. I said, imagine who your donor is. In other words, God took blood right out of his own son, the blood of the new creation, the last Adam. He engrafted that blood on the inside of you. And he said, come on, we're getting ready to say goodbye to you. You'll never be the same person after this. Matter of fact, you and Jesus have the same DNA. You have now have the divine nature and the life of God on the inside of you. This makes you a new creature that never existed before. Huh. Imagine who your donor is. God in Christ, God in a body, come on, created the blood of God and the blood of a new creation and the blood of a new kind of humanity and the blood of the last Adam and he redeemed you with the blood of Jesus. He washed away your sin, made you a new creation and produced the righteousness of God on the inside of you and sin has gone into 100% remission. Molecular remission. Sin cannot dominate you. Satan cannot dominate you. Sickness cannot dominate you. Poverty cannot dominate you. You're a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. Everything has become new. Whew. All right, now listen. So you try to lead people, you know, in a good confession or something, you'll say, Let's all say I'm a new creature in Christ. Oh, thanks, Bible. I'm a new creature in Christ. Oh, thing pass away. Listen, listen, camel breath. Why don't you pay attention here? 
Why don't you pray the Ephesians 1 prayer and see what God has done for you in Christ. That's who you are. That's what you have. The grace of God produced it for you. And by faith, you received it and you agreed with it. You said, this is who I am. Jesus is my Lord. I know I have eternal life. I said, I know I have eternal life. One writer said that eternal life could better be translated the life of the eternal one. Praise the Lord. When you know, and even the devil knows if you know. I said the devil knows if you know. He knows if you know who you are in Christ. Once you know who you are, your position you start here and who you are in Christ, your identification with Christ. Acknowledge that, declare that, hallelujah. Take your place in him. Declare the power of the blood of Jesus over your mind and over your life. Amen. And declare you've got the same life that's in Christ. It's in you right now. That life will rise up on the inside of you. Amen. Stand up on your feet. I guess that meant my time's up. Praise the Lord. Anybody learn anything today? Oh, we have another hour after this for, is that the same people? Oh, I thought, all right, great. We got another hour after this. All right. So y'all got a 10 minute break or something? All right, see y'all in 10 minutes. Hallelujah. We ain't going nowhere. Good morning, everybody. Uh, If you're watching online, this is a continuation of the first session. And we're continuing on in this session on Paul's revelation, who you are in Christ. Praise the Lord. Excuse my voice a little bit. We just finished a leadership conference last week and it was quite, quite wild. Praise the Lord. So we had a lot of fun. Um, We're going to continue on talking about Paul's revelation and uh, who you are in Christ and how that was produced. Praise the Lord. And when I went to Bible college, we had this um, big... um, theology book. And usually in the big theology book, I'd basically love, <clears throat> put one of Kenneth Hagin's books on the authority of the believer in the middle of it, read that while they're reading the theology book. But <clears throat> I learned enough to pass the test. So <clears throat> <laughs> so what happened from <clears throat> the cross to the throne, the apostle Paul is the main explainer of what happened on the cross, the death and resurrection of Christ. And the four Gospels get a proclamation of the gospel. Um, Book of Acts, you get a demonstration of the gospel. Paul's letters, you get an explanation of the gospel. That what happened from the cross to the throne. And so the, the center of the gospel, which <clears throat> Paul says it is the power of God. The gospel of Christ is the power of God. <clears throat> Tongue to salvation, everyone believes you first, also the Greek for there and the righteousness of God's revealed faith, faith, written the just shall live by faith. That's Romans 1, 16 and 17. But he said, the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God. We know the gospel is a message. We know the center of the gospel is what happened from the cross to the resurrection of Christ, to his seating. That's the very center of the gospel. First Corinthians, Paul says that. He said, the fundamental center of the gospel is that Jesus died. He's buried, he's raised from the dead. So what happened in those three days in the death and resurrection of Christ, um, in big theology books, they say so much happened there. All right, let's try that one more time. What happened on the cross, the death of Christ, and how it saves people. So much happened there. So much happened there. That it takes more than one view to actually tell what happened there. So you have four major views of what happened on the cross and how it saves people. Four major views. The first one, the first one they call it the ransom view. Ransom. In other words, man was being held hostage by a power greater than ourselves. And Jesus entered death to overthrow the one that was holding us hostage and to set us free. So the cross was the way Jesus entered death to destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. 
And so something happened in the death of Christ that Jesus actually spoiled, dethroned the Lord of death, stripped him, and he actually did it publicly. So it's really not a secret anywhere but among humans. But in the unseen realm, the devil knows more about his defeat than most Christians because he was there. Let's try that again. I said, the devil knows more about his defeat than most Christians because he was there. So all you got to do is just bring it up. And demons tremble and they run in fear because of what happened in the triumph of Christ. So the, the main title that comes from this first view is that Jesus entered death to destroy him, the, had the power of death. The main title from that comes this, this Jesus is Lord, which really the overriding emphasis of the word Lord, we would say he is supreme authority or he is God manifest in the flesh. Or you would say this, they would say, really, it means he is victor. He is the undisputed, undefeated heavyweight champion of the universe. Jesus is Lord. We know that is the confession that you make. Romans 10, 9, and 10, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is victor. He is Lord. He's champion. He has conquered, which simply means Paul says he descended into the lowest place. And he ascended to the highest place that he might be Lord everywhere. Amen. That means you can't go anywhere he ain't Lord. Excuse my English, but you can't go anywhere that when he shows up, everybody knows who he is. He is Lord. Conquered death, hell, and the grave. And so uh, this, con this comes off one of our confession cards, a great confession that Jesus is Lord, that when Jesus was raised from the dead, a lot of stuff happened there. When Jesus was raised from the dead, he stepped from the tomb as absolute master of death in all of its phases, hell and all of its hosts, Satan and all of his works of sin and all of its consequences. Amen. All right, we're going to read that one more time here because when, amen. Because <laughs> a lot of times people, you know, even on Easter, when Easter comes around, you know, they always want to sing a song that Jesus is alive. But if you look at most people, they think, well, he is alive, but he's, he's just barely alive. <laughs> he's alive, he's alive, and see you next Easter. Anyway, but <laughs> so their picture of Jesus being raised from the dead is he's, you know, he's in the tomb, beating on the stone. Somebody help me get out of here. But nobody had to roll away the stone for him to get out. He's already out. And so when he came, when he stepped from the tomb and you know, when he wasn't limping, he didn't have like charcoal on his face, missing a tooth, you know, and his hair is kind of mangled up and his back is hurting, you know, and he's saying, uh, I'm alive. <laughs> Those last three days were hell, I can tell you. No. Now, when Jesus was raised from the dead, he was not limping. Come on. When he was raised from the dead, he had spoiled principalities, power. Come off the greatest parade in all of history. Amen. And when he was raised from the dead, here and this, and then our confession, it says, he had conquered death in all of its phases, hell in all of its hosts, Satan in all of his works. Sin and all of its consequences. All right, well, let's try that one more time. Come on, he said, all power in heaven and in earth is given unto me. So he's not limping saying, could you give me a boost back to heaven? No. When he's raised from the dead. As Lord of all, he's raised from the dead. He stepped from the tomb as absolute master. Amen. Of death and all of its phases. Amen. That's when you receive eternal life. It is a life in which there is no death. It is literally immortality. 
that Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to us through the gospel. So when you have eternal life, you're saying, I have a God kind of life. I have eternal life. Come on. Celine Dion and the Bee Gees. I'm not sure if they know what immortality is or where you can get it from, but they wrote a beautiful song about it. But you only can get this from Jesus Christ. He's the only one that offers it. He's the only one that has it. So you can't just get it through some philosophy and, and mumbling a few things to yourself in a trance. In other words, you're going to have to go to the cross where Jesus in his death and resurrection now makes that life available to every human being, no matter what language, no matter what nation, that he is Lord. He is Lord. Y'all still with me here? I could go faster if you would listen faster. When Jesus is raised from the dead, he stepped from the tomb as absolute master of death in all of its phases. Because there is what you call physical death, spiritual death, separation from God, and eternal death, which is hell. But Jesus had conquered death in all of its phases. He had conquered hell and every devil and every demon. Matter of fact, your confession that Jesus is Lord actually registers in three places. Number one, when you confess Jesus as Lord, it registers in heaven. Number two, when you confess Jesus as Lord, it registers over every devil and every demon and you're letting the unseen know you cannot dominate me anymore. Jesus is now my Lord. When you confess Jesus as Lord, it actually registers in your own spirit, in your own heart. It is the most powerful confession in all the human race. Jesus Christ is my Lord. So I said, well, why did you say that? Number one, before the almighty God and before the Lord Jesus Christ, who is actually the, uh, he's the advocate, the intercessor and the high priest of my confession. Hebrews 3, 1. Before him. Actually, Jesus said, if you will confess me publicly, I will confess you before the Father. So something happens in heaven when you confess Jesus is Lord. Number two, something happens in the unseen realm. Matter of fact, sometimes you say it just to let the devil know that you know. Somebody say, you talking to me? Well, you could be included, but I'm saying this right now to let every devil, every demon, every spirit in the unseen realm, let them know that I've been delivered from the power of darkness. I've been translated into the kingdom of the son of God. And now in him, I have redemption through his blood, even the remission of sin. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> I, I, Dad Hagen, I've listened to a lot of his messages for many years. And, and um, uh, he was talking about he's preaching in California years ago. And they had, uh, uh, what was it called? The Hong Kong flu or something broke out. And he had had a big church filled in his meeting until the Hong Kong flu broke out. And, they, and everybody was afraid either they had the flu or some people uh, were afraid they're going to get the flu. And uh, so his crowd went down to maybe, I think he said, just like 12, 15 people were there. And he said, and a, and a preacher came, a preacher came to that meeting. And a um, uh, preacher leaned up and said to him in his ear, this is a spirit filled pastor, he said, Aren't you afraid, talking to dad, aren't you afraid you're going to get the Hong Kong flu? He said, no, I don't mind telling you, I'll never have the Hong Kong flu. Amen. And he said, uh, from what I can tell, you said it came from Hong Kong and I only take stuff that comes from heaven. So I don't mind telling you, I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. I'm just trying to tell you right now, I'll never have the Hong Kong flu, he said. 
So when he said that, that preacher leaned back over to him and whispered in his ear, he said, aren't you afraid the devil will hear you say that? See, that preacher had more respect for the devil than he did for what Jesus had done on the cross and the power of God. Aren't you afraid the devil will hear you say that? And Brother Hagin said, no, that's the very dude I wanted him to hear me say that. In other words, my confession, it let the devil know you cannot dominate me and sin cannot dominate me. Old habits cannot dominate me. Sickness cannot dominate. Come on, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And I don't mind telling you, I'll never have a Hong Kong flu. In other words, sometimes your confession is not just for the people around you, but it's for the devil and demons and evil spirits to let them know. Come on, this is your confession of the Lordship of Jesus. Amen. And so I like to add a few other things to that, right? I like to say, the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. I do not lack for ability, I do not lack for opportunity, and I never lack for money. Matter of fact, I never lack for money. I'm a tither, I'm a giver, and the money will come. The money will come. You say, who who are you telling them? I'm letting the devil know that lack can never dominate my life because the Lord is my shepherd. He's my provider. So that registers in heaven. Come on over the unseen devils and demons and in my own heart. My confession. Y'all still with me here? Boy, y'all better pray. I'll get get some more of this in here. Ready? Come on, you got the same life, same righteousness, heir of God, joint heir with Christ. Amen? Same authority. And it works the same way. And you got the same spirit and you got the same spirit of faith. Praise the Lord. All right, let's read some more. Y'all ready? When Jesus was, come on, everything Jesus did, he did it for you. Set to the credit of your account just like you did it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's absolute master of death in all of his phases, hell and all of his hosts of Satan and all of his works of sin and all of its consequences. Jesus, when he stepped from the tomb, he was the first of a redeemed, restored, victorious humanity that would follow him. He is the firstborn from the dead the first man to enter the death experience and master it. He's not the first man raised from the dead. He's called the first born from the dead. In other words, as the first, actually he's called the arc or the archetype or the prototype. Come on, I, I've got a few of the Ford Raptor trucks, you know, and, and different kinds. I like some uh, different kinds of trucks and cars. So before I get one, I want to see the uh, prototype. Then I want to see what's in the prototype. Because whatever is in the prototype is what they're going to put in every other Ford Raptor. Before they make the prototype, come on, then they put it through extreme testing. Come on. Heat. Come on to see if it's going to overheat. Go through the cold. It'll go through the mud. Come on now. Go through the snow. What all it's going to do, go 100 miles, you know, through the Sahara Desert. Jump over a hill. Come on. With with four-wheel drive going on here. This is a special vehicle. So I I bought, over the years, you know, four or five of them. Anyway. (laughs) Once that prototype has passed all the tests of the four-wheel drive, come on, the differential going on, what the transmission will do, what the motor will do, how much horsepower it produce, and what it will do, what the suspension will do, what it'll do in the mud, what it'll do in the rain, what it'll do in the cold, what it'll do in freezing temperature. Once it passed all those tests, they says, this now is the prototype. And we're gonna put the same equipment in every other Raptor. 
Jesus, the archetype, the prototype, went through extreme testing, passed every test, Guaranteed not to collapse, not to break down. Come on now. To go through the heat and the cold, through every kind of challenge you could ever have in life. And God said, now he passed every test and I'm gonna give you and you and you and you the same life and same equipment that I put in Christ. Come on, you got the life of Christ in you. Come on, you can go through the mud. You can go through the hot temperatures. You can go through every challenge. Because the life of Christ is on the inside of you. He's the archetype or the prototype. And God put the same life in every believer. Woo! Come on, because the devil will challenge you in every kind of way that he'll try everything on you. But Jesus already conquered in every, every facet, every aspect. And that life is on the inside of you. The first man, the last Adam, the prototype, the archetype, and you were made alive with him, raised up with him, seated together with him. You're a new creature in Christ. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. Matter of fact, God wouldn't make an unrighteous new creature. Come on, if you're a new creature, you must be the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh my. All right, let's keep going. Praise the Lord. Number one, the gospel. Four major views of what happened in the death and resurrection of Christ. Listen. And the gospel is a message. And the devil is just as afraid of the message as he is of the events. All right, let's try this out over here. The same power that's in the events is in the message. It's the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God. (laughs) And the tremendous power. Why did God use such tremendous power when he raised Christ from the dead? Because Paul says in Ephesians 1, exceeding great, unlimited, immeasurable power. Why did he use such tremendous power when he raised Christ from the dead? Because Jesus was not overcoming rigor mortis. (laughs) Rigor mortis is serious. You get stiff and they put you six feet under. But when God raised Christ from the dead, he was not overcoming rigor mortis. Why did God use such tremendous power? Because God used enough power to undo everything Satan had done in Adam. Not just overcome rigor mortis. Come on, not just when you die, you're gonna go to heaven. Come on, but the life of God on the inside of you and the power of the believer, the authority of the believer, move mountains. Undo everything Satan has done. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, well, I, I, I'll, I'll try to finish this part because I, I really have some other parts. So number one is Jesus is the prototype. He is Lord. And he entered death. And we call that what? The ransom view. The number two view <laughs> It's called substitution or satisfaction. Substitution or satisfaction simply means that Jesus went to the cross as our substitute, paid the penalty in full for sin, and he was not raised from the dead until the claims of justice were satisfied. Once the claims of justice were satisfied, God raised him from the dead. All right, Romans 4.25. That Jesus died because of our sins and he was raised because of our justification. Y'all still here? He was delivered up because of our offenses, raised again for our justification. All right, let's go over this like this. Jesus went to the cross because of our sin and he was raised because of our justification. All right, let's go over it like this. Jesus went to the cross because of our sin and he was not raised from the dead until we were declared justified. Come
Come on, he went to the cross because of our sin. And he was not raised from the dead until we were declared righteous. So that's why all you got to do is believe in your heart. God raised Jesus from the dead. Confess with your mouth that he is Lord. And you are saved. In other words, what happened in the death and the resurrection of Christ? Substitution, satisfaction. All right, number three. Here's the third one. The third one is called the blood covenant. Blood covenant. Wow. The blood covenant. The blood of Jesus poured out on the cross as our substitute. What happened? The necessity of that blood and what happened when Jesus was raised from the dead, he took his blood. The power of the blood. Matter of fact, you say the, the resurrection power is actually in every facet of the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and the message of the word. Amen. When the name of Jesus is spoken on the lips of somebody who knows what happened. Come on, when you declare the power of the blood of Jesus and you know what happened with that blood. Amen. When you speak the, the word, the gospel, and you know what happened. You can go to Africa, you can go to India, you can go. <laughs> Come on, there's several countries won't even let me in anymore. I am a dangerous man. Come on, cause I'm packing, amen. I, I got some power that raised Christ from the dead available. Listen, it will change that whole nation. Come on. China wouldn't like me in there. Come on, why? Cause the power of the gospel, the name of Jesus, the authority of the believer. You are dangerous. <laughs> Amen. You don't look like that. Come on, you don't look like you that much, but when you're carrying the gospel of Christ, it is the power of God in every city, every nation, every language, every village, everywhere you go, Jesus is Lord. So what happened? Praise the Lord. You know, Hillary Clinton wrote a book after the last election she lost. What happened? So, what happened? So Paul's revelation tells you what God saw, what the devil saw, what angels saw, and what Paul saw, and he wants you to see the same thing. Amen. Amen. On the blood. All right, let's go to the blood real quickly. The blood. Everybody say the blood. blood. Now, here's one of my favorite scriptures. We're talking about the blood covenant. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, and he obtained eternal redemption for us. So imagine what happened. When you get to heaven, you check out this video. You say, I'd like the video of what happened when Jesus raised from the dead brought his blood into heaven's holy place. That's interesting what happened. Because it literally changed heaven. That God himself now lives in constant view of the blood of Christ. Matter of fact, when you have faith in the blood of Jesus, God sees you through that blood as blameless and holy and without reproach before him. He sees you as 100% righteous. The blood of Jesus, and Jesus took his blood into heaven and he obtained eternal redemption for us. How many of y'all sang this growing up? There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free? All right, let's keep going. Now, the blood. Now, my mama did this. Uh, um, my mama would say, I plead the blood. And as I grew up, my mama pleads. She said, I plead the blood. And really, that term is used in the Old Testament. I plead the blood. But it's synonymous with faith in the blood in Romans 3.25. 
In other words, you, if you were to say, I plead the blood, or if you say, my faith or my confidence is in the blood of Jesus. Or when you say, I plead the blood, that simply means this. I rest my case on the power of the blood of Jesus. That means the Holy Spirit has never lost a case. And I rest my case, not on what I have done, but on what Jesus has done. I rest my case on his blood. So my mama would say, I plead the blood. And many, many uses for I plead the blood. I'm only alive today because my mama would do what I call slinging blood everywhere. (laughs) If you came to worship, it says in Hebrews chapter 9 that the priest would take blood, sprinkle the book, come on all the instruments of worship, and sprinkle all the people. That means if you wanted to worship, you're going to get blood on you. How many glad we don't do that today? But we do that by faith in the blood. In other words, um, Andrew Murray said, the sprinkling of blood is the highest act of worship. In other words, we do praise and all the good songs are praise songs, but the moment you sing a song about the blood, the application of the blood by faith is the highest act of worship. Why, what, what will that do? It gives you boldness to enter right into the holiest by the blood of the Lamb. So my mama's blood, I plead the blood. I plead the blood. We're on a trip, I plead the blood. I've had terrible accidents as a teenager, doing some pretty stupid stuff. And my dad and deacons had to come get me out of jail, doing pretty stupid stuff. Uh, I even brought my girlfriend home from high school, introduced her to my mom. She had one of the mini skirts on, you know. And I said, Mom, it's my girlfriend. My mom said, I plead the blood of she- <laughs> Plead the blood. <laughs> well, me and that girl finally broke up, you know. So I went to Bible college and Brent brought Trina home, and my mama said, Oh, thank God for the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Amen. So some people don't understand the term, you know, and they want a conflict about it. But listen, my, my, my mom and dad used, I plead the blood. Dad Hagen said, I never understood what they were doing when I came among spirit-filled people and they'd say, I plead the blood. And they'd say it this way, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood. What does that mean? Well, that means this. If you're having um, thoughts coming against your mind, you're having challenge or danger, come on, or you need protection. He said, the Pentecostal spirit-filled people say, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood. He said, I didn't understand what they did. He said, but I started doing it anyway. He said, it worked so well for me. He said, I still do it to this day. All right, let's try that again. He said, it worked so well for me. To this day, I would say, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood. What does that mean? That means, devil, you're going to have to take your hands off of God's property because I'm washed in the blood. I'm redeemed by the blood. I apply the blood and I rest my case on the power of that blood. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Case closed. I'm washed in the blood. Go to the next verse. Hebrews 9, 12, verse 14 says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead work to serve the living God? What does that mean? How much more shall the blood of Christ? And look at this, through the eternal spirit. What does that mean? That means the blood of Christ and the eternal spirit, which is the spirit of God, are eternally connected. That means where the blood of Jesus is honored, the Holy Spirit will work. Because he operates on the basis of the blood. So anywhere you have faith in the blood, it opens up the supernatural. Here it says, and he purges your conscience from dead works. Oh, my goodness. Ah, all right. All right. Y'all still with me here? Go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Verse 1 and 2. And he says this, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. And he says this, talking about the purging of your conscience. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 1. He says, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continue to make the comers there into perfect. Everybody say perfect. In other words, he said the Old Testament, the law could not produce what needed to be done, so it was not perfect. Now, the word perfect is in the book of Hebrews 13 times. 
Many times it's referring to what the law in the Old Testament was imperfect, but the new covenant, the blood covenant now is perfect. Right? He said the worshipers could not make them perfect. Go to the next verse, verse two. And he says this, for then would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. In other words, he said, if the Old Testament would have worked, it would have removed sin consciousness. He said, but they were forgiven, but the Old Testament blood sacrifices could not remove sin consciousness or could not remove guilt or could not remove shame. In other words, their sins were covered. They knew they were forgiven, but they still had sin consciousness. But the blood of Jesus, the blood of the new covenant has the power to remove sin consciousness. You are redeemed from sin consciousness, not just from what happened. You're removed from the sense of guilt or shame that, of what happened. Are y'all still here? The blood of Jesus said reaches into your conscience and silences the voice of self-condemnation. Listen, in the Old Testament, God said, I will not remember your sins. That's Old Testament. In the New Testament, God said, and neither will you. Come on, Old Testament, God said, I forgot about it. He said, the New Testament, because of the blood, I will cleanse your conscience from even the memory of what has happened in your life. Boy, you ought to get happy already. I said, the blood of Jesus will cleanse your conscience and your memory so you don't have to live haunted he says, no more conscience. One translation says, you will no longer be haunted by sin or guilt. Go ahead and laugh for a minute and say, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Come on, the devil bring it up. You say, well, that doesn't exist anymore, Mr. Devil. I don't know what you're talking about because I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus and the blood has removed the guilt and the shame and the stain of sin. And I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, 100% righteous. Uh, when my kids were, were little, we had a, one of those vans, a Dodge van back in those days. And our kids were probably like seven or eight years old. And uh, we were on a little family vacation from Dallas, you know, going up to Oklahoma. So, uh, you know, the, one of these tourist places where they uh, have like this uh, animals where you drive in there and all these animals are there. And so you buy a couple of buckets of feed, you drive through there and you feed their animals. And uh, so we decided, well, let's go in there we're on vacation. So we drove through there. All you see is a bunch of deer when you first get there. So, well, we got deer in our backyard. We ain't concerned with deer. So, so we saw some deer. Well, then we came across, and I was driving, and my daughter, Alicia, was in the front seat with me, and my wife was in the back seat with our son, Aaron. And so we got our windows down, got two buckets of feed, and we're going, and, and along comes uh, a llama. So a llama, you know, looks kind of like a camel, little miniature camel. He's got hair, you know, all over his face, hanging down, eyeballs kind of on the side, big eyeballs, got a big snout, you know, like a camel. So uh, I said, hey, there's a llama. I said, Alicia, feed, feed the llama. And she goes, oh, no. So she rolled her window up. And I said, uh, I ain't afraid of no llama. I said, llama must have heard me walk around the van. he come over there. So I this llama's big old ugly head. He sticks his head up in there. And so I, I stuck the bucket up there and he starts eating out of the bucket. And he kept pushing and pushing till his whole head was in the van and the steering wheel's here and my bucket's here and his head's right here and he's eating. So we were a little nervous, you know, my daughter's going, ah, yeah. and then, um, I'm like, yeah. getting to know him a lot better than we were planning. So... He's eating out of that bucket. Then he pulled his head out of the bucket and he sneezed. All right. When this llama sneezed, there was llama snot, orange and green and brown snot. There were particles of boogers and snot and slime and uh, grass that came out of his mouth, out of his nose, all over the front dash of my van. And the smell was worse than you can imagine. So my daughter's going, ah! 
Trina's in the back. Ah, ah look at it. Llama snot all over my van. And I hit the llama in the head and said, get your big ugly head out of here. <laughs> Boom. So, man, we got this stuff all over the dash. Slimy. So we said, let's get out of here. So we're driving. They're trying to find paper towels, anything, you know. And we're trying to wipe down this llama sneeze off of the van. We're trying to wipe it down. You got to have a bunch of them wiping. He's trying to get rid of all the evidence. So we go straight to a store and get some 409, you know. We sprayed it down with 409. And, ooh, man, we're getting rid of all that. <laughs> so we thought, well, we got rid of the sneeze. So we stopped at a hotel, spent the night. Next morning we woke up, we got in the van, we went, oh, I don't see no evidence, but I can smell. I think that that sneeze had got down in the cracks of the dash of my van. And so, so that the smell was in there. I thought, oh, so we went and got 409, new and improved, 409, 4, 410, 412, 15. This went on day after day. We're trying to get in the cracks, you know, to get the llama sneeze out of my van. And uh, nothing seemed to work. We just couldn't get the smell out. So we uh, got the new car smell. We sprayed that in there, you know, and it smelled like new car and llama sneeze. So then... <laughs> And then we got some strawberry stuff, you know, hang it in there. It smelled like llama sneeze and strawberries. Anyway, make a long story short, I sold the van. So, so the guy that bought it, he said, what does that smell? I said, it, it smelled like strawberries to me. So he bought the van. I went and got a new one because I like the new car smell. Well, a lot of people come to Jesus, you know, after the devil has in their life, blown some snot in there. They come to the Lord, boy, they're trying to clean it up, get rid of the evidence, right? And they do their best to get rid of the evidence, but they can never get rid of the smell. Come on now. And so there's no evidence they ever had that situation. No evidence they ever did that as far as you can see. But you see sin, consciousness, and guilt, and shame on them. They feel somehow like they don't really quite measure up. Oh, come on now. But the power of the blood of Jesus does not just get rid of the evidence. It actually reaches into your conscience and gets rid of the guilt and the shame and the stain. That's the power of the blood. And he brings you back to the new creation smell. I said, we want the new creation smell. Come on, we want you to walk like you're righteous and talk like you're righteous. Hold your head up like you're a new creature in Christ. Hold your head up like the blood of Jesus and the love of Christ has changed your life. Woo! The blood, the blood. In the name of Jesus. I plead the blood. In the name of Jesus, I plead the blood. I said, in the name of Jesus, I plead the blood. You are no longer haunted by the sense of sin. Woo. Woo. Come on, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. A new creation in him. Ha, ha, ha. Through the blood. Wow. All right, let's do this real quick. I just got a few more minutes. And I hadn't even got to my fourth point. All right. And this is the introduction to my next message. Go from Hebrews 10. Oh, my goodness. Let's go to 19. We'll, we'll skip a little bit. God said, I will not remember your sins. You know, that's all 14, 15, 16. And the Holy Spirit is a witness that God said, I will not remember your sins. He said, I don't even remember you ever did anything wrong. I put a new heart, new spirit in you. And he says, now you have brethren to boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Amen. I call that how to have a meeting with God. Amen. Come on, you cannot have a meeting with God and not know it. Come on, we're not talking about religion because religion, come on, will clean you up and leave the smell. I said, we ain't talking about religion. Come on, come on, you have to carry that smell the rest of your life. Said, I'm still unworthy. But no, you say, but I'm washed in the blood of Jesus. I'm a, the righteousness of God in Christ. The blood will remove sin consciousness. The blood covenant. 
So he says this, brethren, bone and sin of the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, verse 18, by a new and living way, which he, by a new and living way, but oh, now we're remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. Missed that, believe it or not. So um, where remission of these is, what kind of remission? Molecular remission, which means cancellation of penalty and the removal of guilt. Hebrews 10, 18, 19, we're going, we're going 19, now go to 20. There you go. We got 19. Go to 20. By a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is say his flesh. Look at verse, verse 21. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us, uh, having a high priest over the house of God, look at verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water. Boy, you ought to get happy. Come on. He says, the blood of Jesus removes sin, consciousness, and guilt and shame is removed. Come on. Our, actually, Andrew Murray said, the blood of Jesus silences the voice of self-condemnation. That tells you, you don't measure up. You need to try harder. Come on. You're going to have to struggle with this. You don't quite measure up. But the moment the blood is applied, it silences the voice of self-condemnation. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Look at this, full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith, no doubt. Where'd you get your full assurance from? From the blood covenant. Hey, here's a good one. Well, a good friend of mine named Pastor Mac Hammond from Minneapolis. Anybody from Minnesota? Anyway, Pastor Mac in the north side of Minneapolis. He was just, just did a meeting with us down in Louisiana. So Pastor Mac... <clears throat> He was struggling with some challenges, you know. And he said, the Lord said this to him. The Lord said, when are you going to act like you have a covenant with God? Come on, we're talking about the blood covenant. God's loving kindness and tender mercies towards you to a thousand generations. When are you going to act? like you have a covenant with God. He said, well, uh, and really that's the definition of faith. Let's try that again. The definition of faith is to act like you have a blood covenant. When are you gonna act like you have a covenant with God? So let's see if we can find a blood covenant confession where Jesus said in Hebrews chapter 13, five and six, he said, I will never leave you, never, ever. Actually, in the Greek, it means under any circumstances, never fail you, never leave you for no reason, never leave you. It's Hebrews, what, 13, 5 and 6. I will never, never, ever, ever, never, 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 ever leave you, abandon you, or forsake you without, uh, without appropriate help. Look at the next verse. So you can boldly say, Come on, this is your blood covenant confession. I said, this is your blood covenant confession. When you understand the blood covenant, you boldly say, what? The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Let's try that together. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do unto me. I got a covenant with the almighty God through the blood of Christ and through his blood and my faith in his blood means I have accurate knowledge and I have a bold confession of what the blood has done for me in heaven, what it's done over hell, what it does in my heart. Wow, I have to quit. I think my time's almost up. But look, the blood covenant, that's number three. What's the first one? Ransom view. He entered death to do what? Destroy him that had the power of death. The second one is what? Substitute. substitute and satisfaction. That's really where we get identification. Everything Jesus did as our substitute. The third one is what? Blood covenant. Here's the fourth one. The fourth one, they just call it the love view. Because when people see the cross, what happened on the cross, they may not fully understand what happened there. But the love of Christ is so strong that it touches their heart and draws them to Jesus. That's why I call the blood of Jesus liquid love. Liquid love flows from the heart of God and it reaches into the heart of the believer. 
and heals you where you have been wounded or broken by life and sets you free. The divine nature and the life of God, the righteousness of God comes into you by faith in his blood, by your identification with Christ. Wow. Well, this session's over, huh? So run up here. I'm supposed to be finished. Ha ha. How many thank God you're redeemed by the blood? How many glad you're a new creature in Christ? All right. I'll let you have it. Praise the Lord. Oh. Praise the Lord. All right. Thank you, brother. And that was powerful. So what we'd like to do right now at this time is to give Mark and uh, Trina a offering for them and, and their ministry. So if you can come forward and pass out the envelopes, I'd greatly appreciate that. Um, some housekeeping. So just a general rule of thumb. We just ask that you always fill out the envelopes fully, uh, whether you're given by card or cash. That way we can give you a receipt. But then also checks will always be made out to Karis Bible College, and then we will always make sure that it gets to the speaker. So if you're given by a um, check, make it out to Karis Bible College, and we'll make sure that it gets to Mark uh, and uh, Trina and their ministry. How powerful is that? Come on. There are so many nuggets in that. It is ridiculous. And, um, you know, whether... if. For those online, I encourage you to go back. But then also, you know, this was recorded. So please feel free to go back and listen to what Brother Mark was just sharing. There are so many truths in Christ. In, and in Christ, the confession of your testimony never returns void. In Christ, pleading the blood over your life, standing on the promises and doing what Mark was just saying, the authority you have over the enemy, it never returns void. And in Christ, your seed and what you sow never returns void. So I encourage you to give generously. I encourage you to give out of, out of what you've purposed in your heart. And I encourage you not only to give generously because it'll never return void. I encourage you to speak the truth generously over your circumstances, realizing it'll never return void. I encourage you to stand on this and live generously. Believe God in all the different situations in your life, and it's not going to return void. So if you can, please collect the offering. I'd like to just bless it. Father, I love you, and I thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for the, the word that you put in Mark's mouth to teach to us and, and all the fruit that it's going to bear in our lives, not only for this season, but for seasons to come what we can impart into others, into other generations, and that this word will not cease from building fruit <laughs> until the day of the Lord. And this is going to just bring wonderful things. And I also thank you for this offering, that it's going to do the same thing for Mark and Trina, that this, this offering is going to be a blessing to their life, a blessing to the ministry, and for every single person that their ministry touches. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you. God bless you. Enjoy your break.